It happened in the span of a few minutes one night at the start of eighth grade, as I stared into the bathroom mirror to brush my teeth. As a child, I had a strong sense of who I was. I belonged in nature, exploring with my dog or at the hockey rink on Sunday mornings, outscoring the boys. I was sensitive and happy and alive. But as I stared into the mirror that night in grade eight, my vision blurred. And suddenly the person looking back at me was a stranger. I was completely freaked out by this. I realized I didn't really know who I was. I was just an imposter acting out a story I hadn't written for myself. The perfect student, the respected class president, the star athlete. I felt trapped in someone else's life and totally alone. On the surface, I continued on as the same student athlete. While underneath, I began to think racing thoughts about death. I'd escape these feelings by harming or starving my body, trying drugs, or drinking till I'd black out. It went on and on until my second semester at university when I couldn't handle it anymore. I wasn't sleeping. My mind was racing. I knew I needed professional help. I remember walking in past the aged iron gates and feeling a sense of hope as I gazed up at the iconic 200-year-old McLean Hospital at the crest of the wooded hill. I left my first session with my new psychiatrist and called my father immediately, tears of joy streaming down my face. Dad, everything's going to be okay, I said. He's figured out the problem. The doctor had explained the story of who I was and what I was feeling in a way that was more concrete than I'd ever felt before. He told me I had bipolar disorder, a brain disease. I'd always had it, but luckily there were medications to treat it. I felt reborn. I walked back down that same hill towards the bus stop, a spring in my step and prescription slips in my hand. Little did I know that seven years later, I'd return through those same iron gates, strapped in the back of an ambulance. Despite following my doctor's orders, as the years passed, I got more and more disconnected from myself, from friends and family, from my creativity. I was told my illness was progressing Two psychiatric drugs became three. Three became four. By the time I was 25, I realized there were only two possible choices. I could either continue on in this miserable existence of treatment-resistant mental illness, or I could end my life. On a cold November day, I made that second choice. I walked to the ocean, sat on the rocks, and I wrote my family a goodbye letter as I slipped into a coma. I'd wake up days later in the hospital to my parents calling my name. My first words to my family were, why am I still here? Two years later, my struggles continued. On a spring morning in 2010, I found myself wandering the aisles in a small bookstore in Vermont when the cover of a book stopped me in my tracks. It felt like I was looking into a mirror once again as the head that stared back at me was decorated with a long list of psychiatric drug names, almost all of which I'd been on. My heart started pounding. I knew somehow that reading this book was very important. The book was called Anatomy of an Epidemic. As I turned page after page, I felt like I'd been hit with a ton of bricks. It showed scientific data that called into question everything I believed about myself, that I had a lifelong chemical imbalance. I felt defensive about my bipolar identity, outraged and confused all at once. But in the midst of that internal chaos, an unfamiliar sensation was also emerging, hope. There was now the possibility of a different future. I had no idea where the path was to get there, but it didn't matter. All I needed was to know it was possible. Over the following months, I began to question the story I'd held on to for so many years. What if I stopped defining my emotional pain as mental illness? What if I began to trust my inner compass instead of looking to doctors as my only answer? What if I took back ownership of my mind and my body? Instead of suppressing my intense emotions, I began to sit with and feel the deep pain of being fully human. I grieved the 14 years I'd lost, the most formative years of my life, because I let a label define my identity. I started writing and speaking about my experiences in the mental health system and began hearing from thousands across the world with similar stories. I started a nonprofit called Inner Compass Initiative that helps people make more informed choices about psychiatric treatments. It's risky to start or stop psychiatric drugs. For people who've decided that withdrawal is right for them, 
we provide information on how to do so as safely as possible and get support from doctors and family along the way. If I could go back to that 13-year-old girl looking in the mirror, I'd tell her, you're not broken. Your emotional pain is here for reasons that have nothing to do with faulty brain chemistry. It's telling you something important about your relationship to yourself and to the world around you, and you need to listen. I'd tell her, your urge to die is really an urge to live just in an entirely different way from what you know. I'd tell her, never stop trusting your inner compass.